Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we dive into the heart of codependency with Melody Beattie's seminal work, Codependent No More. Published in 1986, this book continues to stand as a beacon of hope and guidance for those navigating the challenges of codependent relationships. In this illuminating book, Beattie, a respected figure in the realm of self help literature, breaks down the walls of codependency with practical strategies and empathic wisdom drawn from her personal journey as a recovering alcoholic and codependent. With her background as a recovery counselor, Beattie offers a set of essential tools for healing, empowering readers to disentangle themselves from unhealthy relational dynamics. Codependent No More is a must-read for anyone trapped in the cycle of compulsive caretaking those entrapped in dysfunctional relationships, or individuals grappling with the effects of a loved one's addiction. Gain insights, find clarity, and start your journey towards healing with this episode. Tune in as we explore Melody Beattie's Codependent No More. Codependent. No more. How to Stop Controlling Others and Start Caring for Yourself Introduction Unlock the reality of codependency and seize control of your existence. It's a typical codependent trait to find themselves reacting and often overreacting. Seldom are they found charting their own course. They are often propelled by the issues of others, which ironically leads them to neglect their own. Such reactionary behavior can usually be traced back to stress responses, the persistent unpredictability of living with an alcoholic, for instance. Although these responses may seem to be a form of coping, they eventually result in more harm. The reason behind this is that codependency, much like alcoholism, is a progressive issue. It won't magically improve on its own. Instead, it will likely worsen. In our exploration of Melody Beattie's Codependent No More, you'll come to understand some difficult truths about codependency. Along with these truths, you'll learn actionable steps to take and mental attitudes to adopt that will set you on the path towards recovery. Gradually, you'll develop better coping mechanisms, trust in yourself, and experience the liberation of feeling your own emotions rather than adopting someone else's. In this narrative, you'll discover how to lovingly detach why reaction is more harmful than beneficial, how to overcome the fear associated with feeling your own emotions. Part 1 Chapter 1 Codependency arises from assuming responsibility for others. To heal, we must assume responsibility for ourselves. Consider Jessica, who was wedded to an alcoholic. The red flags were there early on, such as her husband spending their entire honeymoon drinking. But Jessica chose to ignore the harsh reality of his condition. It wasn't until the problem escalated that she could no longer turn a blind eye. Eventually, her husband found sobriety, but Jessica was left with seething resentment. Why was it that she had to shoulder all household chores, manage their life and even maintain their lawn? When her friends proposed accompanying her to Al-Anon, a supportive environment designed for family members of alcoholics that spun off from Alcoholics Anonymous, Jessica's resentment deepened. Why was it that she was the one who needed to put in extra effort when he was the one to blame for all the chaos? She couldn't understand why she had to seek assistance when he was the one recovering. Jessica felt overlooked, silenced, and unloved. There were even moments when Jessica questioned her sanity. However, her mind wasn't the issue, but rather codependency was. Just like alcoholism, codependency, another family ailment, had unleashed devastation in her life. Unfortunately, codependency, like alcoholism, tends to worsen once it takes root. It calls for proactive measures to break free. In Jessica's situation, the origin of the problem became irrelevant. The responsibility to tackle this issue fell on her. The term codependency dates back to the 1970s and was commonly used in the treatment center community. 
It initially referred to those whose lives were adversely impacted due to their relationships with chemically dependent individuals. Codependency acted as a coping mechanism in reaction to another person's substance abuse. Over time, healthcare professionals observed that codependency wasn't exclusive to substance abuse. It was linked to other compulsive disorders like binge eating, gambling, and sex addiction, affecting family members as well. Similarly, it was evident amongst relatives of chronically or mentally ill individuals and those in caregiving professions, including nurses and social workers. Beattie presents a broader definition. A codependent is someone who allows another's behavior to influence them and then obsessively tries to control that individual. This definition is instrumental as it indicates the road to recovery. The goal isn't to change the other person, but to change ourselves. To recover from codependency, we need to realize how profoundly we've let others' behavior affect us, turning us into obsessive, controlling caretakers with a significant deficit in self-worth and an excessive amount of pent-up anger. It's crucial to understand that such behaviors do not make us flawed. They are merely unhealthy stress responses, initially critical for our mental and emotional survival. However, as time has passed, these same responses have become self-destructive. Now, it's time to claim responsibility for our lives and retrieve our existence. Part 2. Chapter 2. By disengaging from the problematic individual in your life, you can gain clarity about your own needs. Assuming responsibility for ourselves might seem intimidating but it doesn't need to happen in one giant leap. It's a daily process that can be incredibly invigorating. Each step towards recovery brings with it a breath of fresh liberation. The journey begins with the concept of detachment. To initiate healing, to start truly feeling our emotions and to begin meeting our needs, we first need to disconnect from the problematic individuals in our lives. So what does this look like in reality? If attachment entails being perpetually consumed and fretful about someone else's issues, detachment is its antithesis. If attachment leads to constantly reacting to others' problems, we detach by tending to our own needs. If attachment results in emotional dependence, we aim to understand our own emotions better. And if attachment involves caretaking, rescuing, and enabling, We permit people to manage their own problems and refocus on ourselves. Detachment is not meant to be frigid or antagonistic. It is not a retreat from life or a weak acquiescence to the nonsense thrown our way. Nor is it a forced, zen-like avoidance of reality. It's possible to detach and yet continue to love, care, and be compassionate. This is because detachment is rooted in the belief that we are all responsible for ourselves. Understanding that we can't solve someone else's problem nullifies the need for worry. If our loved one has sparked a crisis in their life, be it an arrest for drunk driving or procrastination with a college assignment, we allow them to deal with the fallout. This way they get the chance to learn and grow, and we reassure ourselves that we can do the same. While it might be unnerving to let things unfold as they should, it's healthier than trying to maintain a grip on everything. Detachment helps us slowly accept reality and deepen our faith in ourselves, fate, God, destiny, or whatever concept you resonate with. As our relentless pursuit of control subsides, we are released from the strain of worrying about things outside our purview, and we realize that the world continues to turn. The best aspect of detachment is that when we are liberated from the relentless anxiety of worrying about others, our thoughts become clearer, allowing us to make better choices about how to show love and care for our loved ones. We make sound decisions. We cause less harm to ourselves. Consequently, we experience peace. We offer love without manipulation, and we start living our lives free from guilt. Part 3. Chapter 3. Instead of reacting impulsively, pause and respond with intention. Take Maria, for example, who was wedded to an alcoholic. She attempted to keep her husband's drinking under check by always being by his side. 
However, he still managed to find opportunities to drink. One day, during an argument, he asserted that his drinking stemmed from their financial woes. So, Maria decided to get a job. Things seemed to look up. Maria found respect and a newfound independence at her workplace. But once her husband relapsed into drinking, Maria's anxiety returned in full swing. She promptly quit her job to be closer to her husband, hoping to maintain control. But was she truly controlling anything, or was his addiction dictating her life? When we try to control elements that aren't our business, we end up being controlled instead. We sideline our own best interests, gradually growing frustrated and irrational, trying to manipulate the unmanageable. Be it battling someone else's addiction, be it alcohol, food, gambling, or sex, we're engaging in a lost cause. Their addiction overpowers our willpower. No matter how much control we exercise, it's merely an illusion. We might struggle to control our emotional responses, but we delude ourselves into believing we can control others. And even if we somehow manage to control their actions, that still doesn't grant us any control over their feelings, thoughts, or beliefs. One of the most prevalent forms of control we resort to is rescuing or caretaking, similar to what Maria did with her husband. Rescuing means assuming responsibility for another's thoughts, feelings, or actions. However, in our day-to-day lives, it's usually not as intense as Maria's situation. Perhaps we agree when we actually disagree, or we clean up someone else's mess when they could do it themselves. We voice others' thoughts, make decisions for others, feel emotions for others. We offer too much and settle for too little. Despite our belief that we're displaying love, rescuing is, in fact, disrespectful. It implies that the person we're rescuing is inept and incapable of helping themselves, a victim we feel obliged to salvage. So what's the better alternative? Aim to detach by avoiding overreactions. Codependents, riddled with anxiety and fear, tend to react disproportionately to their surroundings. However, when we react, we don't pause to understand our feelings, thus losing the opportunity to contemplate the most appropriate response. In reality, very few instances in life demand urgency. While feelings and thoughts carry significance, they're fleeting and ephemeral. Actions do matter, but on a day-to-day basis, they're unlikely to halt the world. So train yourself to pause before reacting. Be on the lookout for feelings of anxiety, anger, rejection, self-pity, shame, or worry. It's fine to experience these emotions, but the question is, what are you going to do about them? Instead of reacting on impulse, take a step back and seek peace. Go for a walk, meditate, relax, gain clarity about the situation. Instead of obsessing about solving the problem, consider how you could take care of yourself. Part 4. Chapter 4. Dispel self-doubt by embracing self-love. When Beatty embarked on her journey of detachment, she found herself bearing the weight of her own responsibilities. This is when it dawned on her that others weren't the culprits behind the chaos in her life. She was merely using them to evade facing her own issues. Hence, she emphasizes, repeatedly, that the road to recovery, sanity, and happiness commences by attending to our own business and practicing self-care. Adopting a mindset of self-care implies being compassionate towards ourselves. We kickstart this process by assuming responsibility for our lives, encompassing not just the everyday hurdles, but also our spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. While the initial learning curve might seem daunting, fulfilling these needs would be a deeply gratifying and rewarding expedition. We start by discarding the false belief that our needs are insignificant. Regardless of whether others seem indifferent, our needs matter to us, and we owe it to ourselves to respect this. In the past, we might have overlooked our needs, but now it's incumbent upon us to fulfill them. So when times get challenging, we can ask ourselves, What do I need to do to care for myself? Beatty shares an anecdote about a call she received from a fellow Al-Anon member. The woman wanted to part ways with her husband, but she was apprehensive that she wouldn't be capable of caring for herself. She held this belief, despite being gainfully employed, managing the kids, 
and handling all the household chores. This worry about not being self-reliant is a recurrent theme BT has heard from codependents. That's because, underneath the exterior, most codependents are filled with fear, resembling frightened children yearning for love. Worse still, this internal child doesn't believe that we're deserving of love. It has endured a lifetime of abandonment, mistreatment, disappointment, and rejection. To combat such diminished self-worth, we should strive to nurture this internal child. By shifting our focus from others to ourselves, we express respect for this internal child. We shower it with attention and love. We start affirming ourselves instead of seeking validation from others. Over time, we learn to have faith in ourselves. Start this process by loving and accepting yourself as you are in this very moment, cherishing all your idiosyncrasies and imperfections. You'll start experiencing a surge in your inner power as you choose to accept your feelings rather than flee from them. Part 5 Chapter 5 Embracing your emotions can be daunting, yet it's essential for discovering happiness. When Beatty triumphed over a decade-long addiction to alcohol, cocaine, and heroin, her therapists advised her to confront her emotions to maintain her sobriety. This proposition seemed tremendously daunting back then. However, by heeding their counsel, Beatty realized the wisdom behind the old AA adage, feelings are not facts. For many codependents, navigating this emotional landscape can be challenging. Beatty recalls how during family support group sessions she facilitated, when asked about their feelings, participants would instead share the emotions of their loved ones. Regardless of the question, their conversation always revolved around someone else. After years of investing their focus on others, they had lost touch with their own feelings. Being codependents, we often opt out of experiencing emotions because of the ensuing pain. Over time, we've learned that emotional vulnerability only precipitates suffering. Sometimes, our emotions can grow so overwhelming and ominous that we feel entirely consumed by them. This can deter us from taking the intimidating steps necessary to improve our lives. Whether attributed to the family environments we were raised in or the partners we chose, recognizing our feelings can be scary. It means accepting that a change is necessary. However, while feelings may trigger sorrow, they also serve as the primary source of joy. By suppressing negative emotions, we inadvertently block our ability to feel the positive ones. Conversely, when we permit ourselves to feel, we can unearth profound truths about ourselves, our authentic desires, aspirations, wants, and needs. We might need some external support during this journey. For codependents, the Al-Anon's 12-step program is a valuable aid. These 12-step programs extend beyond just promoting sobriety. They take individuals who are struggling and equip them with the skills to rebuild their lives and make forward strides. The commitment to work with the program is pivotal in yielding results. This includes attending meetings, listening to anonymous members share their experiences, strengths, or hopes. There are no membership roles, sign-up sheets, or fees. All you need to do is show up, listen, and if you wish, share your own experiences. For many, these meetings are an eye-opener. It's often the first time they hear their own experiences articulated by someone else. Hearing these relatable stories enables us to gradually step out of our protective shells and be our genuine selves. It makes confronting our problems easier because, finally, we're not alone in our struggle. In time, we begin to comprehend how the steps function. We contemplate how to apply them in our own lives during the day. When faced with a problem, we can always reach out to another Al-Anon member for advice. Gradually, the steps evolve into both habits and a lifestyle. They guide us in problem solving and managing emotional disturbances, as well as navigating life's obstacles with grace. The simplicity of the 12-step programs is precisely why they're effective. But there's also a magical transformation that occurs. While it might seem implausible on paper, attending meetings and working through the program induces a sense of tranquility. Our lives transform and we undergo changes too. The problems don't resolve all at once, 
but they do get resolved when the time is ripe. The more we yield to the program, the more enriched, healthier, and fulfilled our lives become. Final summary. Congratulations on completing our recap of Codependent No More by Melody Beatty. If there's one key insight to take away, it's that each of us is accountable for our own lives. We didn't cause the problems plaguing our loved ones, and as such, we can't fix them. However, we can work on ourselves by accepting responsibility for our lives, our emotions, and our journey to healing. Through this recap, you've perhaps discovered some fundamental truths about yourself, along with a few tools to aid your recovery journey. Keep in mind, however, that recovery is akin to learning a musical instrument, like the piano. It demands patience, practice, and time. So, practice taking it one day at a time, and never hesitate to seek help. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then, happy reading and happy listening.